Hello, everyone. I would like to call the Longmont Housing Authority Board of Commissioners regular meeting um, to, <clears throat> to order. It's Tuesday, October 15th, 2024. Um, let's have a roll call. Um, Commissioner Chuck. Commissioner Alvaro. Commissioner Martin. Um, Eric Morris, Executive Assistant. Molly O'Donnell, Housing Director. Kim Daniels, County Supervisor. Tim Hall, Assistant City Chair. Um, Harold Dominguez, Interim Executive Director. Lauren Sully, Assistant Director. Sean McCoy, Commissioner. Sarah, Public Safety. Commissioner Aaron Rodriguez. Commissioner Susie Elmer Barron. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Diane Christ is absent. Um, do we have any agenda additions? Submissions and we, I need a vote for the September 17th, 2024 minutes. Can I have a motion? Move the September 17th, 2024, 2024 minutes as presented. Second. So they're seconded by uh, Commissioner Yarbrough. Um, is there any discussion on those minutes? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 That passes six to zero with a uh, commission uh, We are now at public invited to be heard. I saw public out there. I hear them. <laughs> uh, seeing no one, I will close public invited to be heard. We are now at old new business. A resolution LHA 2024-21. <laughs> is to accept an agreement for delegation of activities for the suite's door replacement project. Uh, Molly? Uh, Molly Donald, Housing Director, once again. Um, this is the CDBG agreement to replace the suite's doors. Council approved this on the city side October 8th, so I won't repeat any information, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to go over what this grant agreement does. Are there any questions about this agreement? Resolution. If not, can I have a motion to move to adopt? Yeah. Approve whatever it is we do. Seconded. Okay. It's been moved by Councillor, by sorry, Commissioner uh, Martin to move LHA 2024-21 resolution. Seconded by Commissioner um, McCoy. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? And that passes. That passes yeah. six to zero with the Commissioner. That's Absolutely. Uh, we are now on status update for federal COVID-19 relief funding and expenditures for LHA capital improvements. Who is going to have this one? Hey, Molly, let me start with this one. So, uh, commissioners, this is, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about this from the ARPA fund, and then we'll, I'll walk you into the uh, component in terms of the LHA expenditures on this. So, um, as you know, we brought you several projects um, on our funding that you can see in the yellow. What I'm going to talk about is what we're seeing in the blue. Um, as, as we're getting, getting close to the end of the year, um, under the ARPA rules, you have to have projects contracted by the end of this year. You have until 2026 to spend it down. If you don't have it contracted by the end of this year and and you're unable to spend it down between in 25 and 26, then you have to send the money back um, to the federal government. What we were starting to see is that we had a significant amount of money in ARPA dollars that were on positions. And those positions um, would be filled and they would be vacant. And, and so, as I was talking to Peter, we had a lot of concerns um, just related to the status of those funds uh, because if we didn't have a place to sweep it to, then basically we're going to have to send that money back to the federal government. Uh, and that's just natural attrition of the position. So, we've also been earning interest on the ARPA money, of which we can, which we can utilize, and it has less restrictions than the actual ARPA dollars. So, um, in doing that, we, um, to date, a couple of weeks ago, we had $226,000 in interest. So we actually used the interest funding to put into the positions. 
because we didn't have the same restrictions. We then moved the money from the positions into, and we did some other things. So we did 54,000 of interest money uh, for the housing authority cameras we've been talking to you all about. That's because of submitting requirements. Um, and then we had, then we had um, the 85,000 of ARPA that's federalized, which the cameras would bid to accomplish that. We then put, we're going to contract with the LHA. The LHA is going to contract with the city for $80,000 of the unit terms. We talked about how we were behind on that. Um, and then we have to have a contract to have a placeholder um, for accessibility issues at the LHA properties. And so we put $6,000 in that. Uh, and then, and, and that's really just a placeholder because once you contract it, you can sweep into it. We think there's a potential we're going to have about another hundred thousand dollars in interest, and we'll need to take that interest revenue and push it into these categories. And then, probably January, February of next year, um, we're setting meetings up with the departments that have those positions that were funded with ARPA dollars um, to really make some decisions on where we sit in terms of do we keep funding in those positions, um, and that's because. They were term limited positions that we created five years ago, or three years ago. There were five year positions. As you start getting closer into the deadline, you have less time on those positions, which means that it's more unlikely that people will actually apply for them because it's only, you know, right now it'd be a two year job at best. Mm -hmm. And as you move in, then it becomes a one year job, and then it, you know, less than a year. And we're already seeing challenges and filling those positions. So the sweep categories that we're going to be utilizing for ARPA funds um, will be the LHA accessibility um, and then some of the unit terms um, ongoing. That way we don't have to send any money back because those are all eligible expenses. Sure. Well, that's the plan. <laughs> So I think I'll just kind of highlight our progress that we've made. Um, just to clarify, the um, yellow means that we've completely expended the funds, already expended the funds. Uh, this pinkish orange is we've encumbered the funds through a contract, either a contract to LHA, which is an IGA, which is one method, or it's got under underway completely with a vendor. And then the... Um, Blue is obligation in progress, so this is, you're going to see, we're doing this summary now because at our November 19th meeting, both on the council side and city side, you'll see several agreements come through and covering the rest of these funds. And then this is our unfunded for project swoop in the, this is a little testy, um, with no color yet. So that's costs that we have lined up and that we could use once the funding is available. So I think overall what I'll just show you is kind of our progress since we started spending this money in 2022. Um, we have expended, oh I wish I had an expended total, but in total we've got about $9.5 million of work, the vast majority of which has already been accomplished. The expenditures has been completed. Um, so I just want to highlight this for for you all to know that we've been working hard um, to get it spent and appreciate the allocation and thank you to, it took a lot of team members to make this happen because there's a lot from start to finish. So I think I'll just hold the rest for questions if there are any because Harold's description is what you're gonna see coming here in the next month. Okay. I do have a question for Harold but maybe I missed it when you were giving the update. Which positions uh, are you talking about? Um, they're not for the housing authority. So um, we funded some. There's one position in youth services. Um, there's one position in community and neighborhood services. And there's one position that's in uh, Emily's department. I think those are the three that happen. They can't keep them filled. So one was like Alejandro that then moved into a permanent position. Mm -hmm. and, and so the, ch the challenge is they can't keep them filled. They haven't been filled. And it's becoming more difficult to fill them because of term limit. Okay. And I think that's it. Thank you. 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 Th
and I was able to just filter to see what we have expended. Of the 9.5 9 we expect to spend, we have spent 8.7. Great. I'm glad you're doing that because we don't know what's going to happen in the money. <laughs> Is. Yeah, so we have, we have all the money from ARPA, and that's why we're, we're adjusting it so we don't have to sit it back. Good. Okay, great. So um, that was just an update, but we need to approve and adopt the 2025 property and agency budgets. The first one is what we need budget presentation. Next up. Okay, so we will start. Um, some of the challenges LHA has is revenue and uncertainty, um, mainly because we have HCB vouchers which are portable. So this year we did decide to budget a portion of that because we do have some properties that have a lot of HCB vouchers, portable vouchers, and if we budget just a portion of that, it might also be able to do items in the budget that we normally can't, like landscaping. Um, things that we haven't been able to take care of at these properties. So we did budget a little um, on the HCB voucher side. Um, developer fees too, that's really all dependent on cash flow from all the properties. So depending on how good the properties do, we get developer fees. But that can change depending on how it works. So we have some currently in development that give you a schedule that when you're going to get developer fees. But if construction goes longer or anything like that, the developer fees come in at a different time. So we budget as best as we can with what we think is coming in and have to kind of navigate that as we go through the year, um, as revenue comes in and expenditures occur. So what Kendra's talking about with the vouchers, one of the things we've talked about is it's really there's a hedge that we're looking at. So. Uh, we talked about how many vouchers do we have in the property, how often do those vouchers turn, and then we said, what was it, 30%? Yeah, I think we did like a And so then we took 30% of the total, which gave us 70% hedge. And so that's why at the end of the year, you see a lot of times that the properties perform above budget. It's because we, we didn't have enough experience to understand how to hedge it as we took this over. We're now feeling a little bit more comfortable that said, okay, we'll hedge at this level, but we still have that flex. That way, if people do move out with vouchers and move to another location, it doesn't cause a bust mm -hmm. in the revenue side of the budget. So it's a conservative estimate on what we're looking at with the vouchers. <coughs> we have inflationary costs, like everyone. Um, our repairs are definitely seeing an increase in costs. Um, we're going to have the increase similar to the city with the benefits, which is about a 12% increase in benefits. Um, we're also seeing utility increases anywhere from 3.5% to 10%, depending on the utility. Um, so, can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. Is that because of the, our rise in utility rates, or is it be from another reason the utility rates going up? Like Most that? of these are a rise in our utility rates plus whatever Excel does. And usually, a, we don't know what Excel is going to do, <laughs> so we kind of budget, and usually it's on the higher percent just just to be safe. Um, but most, um, I usually get the increases from utility from Public Works, so they let me know what the utilities are going to increase, and then I take that against what's happened in this year. Um, a lot of the times we have to also figure out, like this year we had a couple months where there was a, a lag in water because we were trying to get irrigation repairs. Oh, okay. So I have to be careful because this year we may not have the irrigation repairs and our waters may be higher than it is this year. So it's taking that and gauging it to see what it's what the utility is going to be. Okay. You're, you're also managing weather. So, you know, this year um, our electric expense is probably going to be higher than our gas expense because it's been warmer this year. And, and so your the other variable is weather, just like your house. Mm -hmm. So our utility bills are going to flex just like our utility bills that do at home based on what the environmental conditions are in the car. 
we are budgeting at 100% of market, about 101, um, and then our benefit increase is about approximately 12%. So the rent increases for 2025, and these are for federally assisted um, properties. So the Hearthstone and Lodge, they are um, funded fully by HUD vouchers. Um, we did a lodge increase of 4.27% and Hearthstone of 5.15% increase. Um, this is all on HUD. So it's all dependent on if they have the budget to fund those increases. And last year we didn't even get the contracts renewed into like May, April or May, which was almost six months after the contract expired. So in these circumstances, sometimes LHA has to fund these H these two properties until the contract is approved by HUD and we get the additional subsidy. Do you get what you do you get back what you've already how do I say this? What you funded is in that contract. <coughs> As long as they fund it. So, okay. like, if they give us the 5.15, they'll go back That's if, to the contract okay. um, expire date and, and let us okay. fill that need. Yeah. The Suites Apartments, because we are in a voucher shortfall right now, we did not do an increase to fair market for the Suites. And that means going to DOH and asking for an increase. And then what usually happens is LHA matches that increase that DOH approves. But because we're in a shortfall, we kept the studio apartments and one and two bedrooms at the same level as 2024. Um, realize, again, these don't affect the individuals at the property unless their income changes. So usually it's all subsidy driven as well, unless their income changes. And then we have Zinnia, and um, there's an error here because I just found out that the in their portfolio they had estimated the vouchers would be 1,675, but they will be higher than that. They're going to be 1,823. Um, we received the DOH contract today, so um, those will be. They're currently budgeted at 1675, but that's going to be an increase that Zinnia is going to have in their portfolio. Now Zinnia is a little, I think we have to remember with Zinnia, it's a slightly different type of property because we're not the owner of the property. Right. And that so is. we're contractually obligated to manage it. So when you think of the reserve requirements and, and method units and things like that, that doesn't necessarily fall on us. That will fall on Element, who is the owner of the property. So do they pay you for management? Mm -hmm. They do, they pay 8%. 8%, okay. yeah. So the next is the rent increases for outlined for our other properties. Right now we are doing a 5% rental increase for the rest of the properties. Um, now, the 5% is the max. If they're already currently at tax credit rent, and tax credit in April only pre increases 3%, that's all they would see. They would only see a 3% because we can't go um, over the tax credit rent limits. But if they are below that, then they would see the 5%. So it could be anywhere from 1% to 5% depending on where they're at and depending on what the tax credits increase. Um, tenants will get a note where everybody is waiting <laughs> for the budgets to get approved so they can actually start doing their um, 60 day certifications and let people know what this increase is. Um, and after that, after approval, we'll give a notice to the tenants to let them know what the increase is going to be. And then we typically, we typically circle in on coffee and conversations mm -hmm. and have a conversation every year. Mm -hmm. um, Here's what the rent increase is going to be. No, that doesn't mean that it's absolutely going to be yours. Yours is specific to you. And you need to meet with property managers to see what that's going to be and when it's going to start based on what you have to recertify. And so you have to tell them what the highest is. What the highest increase is going to be, but then it's going to vary by every person depending on where they are. And if they have a voucher or if they have. Yeah. One thing I will say is that all of these are usually due to the investor buying them first. 
so the investor could come back with questions or issues or, or items that they may want us to increase or include um, or exclude. We haven't really ran into that um, in, in the years we've been doing, but we do give this to them and they could come back and say, you know, we don't want that <laughs> in our budget type of thing. The more expenses they have, the better because um, it just puts them in a situation to get more tax credits. Okay, this is the 2025 fair market rent standards. Based on our admin plan, so what we're asking you to approve is the 2025 standards. Mm -hmm. However, there's kind of an exception to that rule. Based on our admin plan, the admin plan states that we can't change, we can't lower or reduce the fair market rent for individuals already in a half contract. So they're, if they're in a half contract today, they will be at the 2024 fair market rent because that is higher than the 2025. Mm -hmm. However, if somebody um, loses their voucher and you have somebody else come in, or if it's a PBB and and, it, and they lose and somebody comes in, then they would get the new rate at the 2025 rate. So it's only for new half contracts that occur. We are in the process of reviewing the admin plan to see if we can have a more tiered approach for for when we get into shortfalls like this, because there is an option that if you feel like you need to reduce that, you have to give notice for at least a year to the tenants that have a half contract so they can have time to adjust, you know, and make sure that they can support and accommodate the additional rent increase they might incur. But right now, our admin plan as of today says that we will not change if the fair market is reduced. To give you an update on HUD, I wanted to do that too. So we were to meet with HUD um, a week and a half ago, and only our finance guy showed up. The actual <coughs> HUD shortfall team member did not because she was having power outages. Um, but we did submit all of our information for the shortfall. We submitted the application. It sounds like she's prepping for the December over um, for us. And I emailed her today to kind of get a status update to ask what's the status, what exactly are you submitting on our behalf? <laughs> um, but some of the things they actually had us walk through was and, and have Harold certify as one, we've stopped. <coughs> we're stopped. You know, we have, we're not adding new vouchers. And we haven't been adding vouchers since June of 2023 because we were going to be adding PPPs into the village on Maine. Um, the other thing is that we're not absorbing vouchers. Again, we haven't been absorbing vouchers since, Fe since February of 2023, so we're good there. Um, there's other things like that. <coughs> if, if you have people that are moving out, that you're not letting them move out to a higher paid fair market rent. Um, so there's, there's certain things that we have to certify they also did ask us if if you had to if we can't give you the money and you had to pull people off the program to get back out of shortfall, how many people would it be? Based on our admin plan, we have to take the people that have been on the program the longest and go down. And then there's some exceptions. You can't include like bash vouchers, which we don't have, PBB vouchers. Um, you have to exclude the elderly and the disabled. So there's there's certain preferences that are out of the picture. It was 66 people that we would have to kick off the program if 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 that came to where it was. And that that we had this was kind of I don't think we've had people on this program for 33 years. But this was going to hit people that had been on the program anywhere from two years to 33 years with the 66 people that, that are elderly or disabled. Um, and that was just kind of the first glance. You kind of have to go deeper and you have to look at anybody in their household as well. 
So if there's somebody in their household, like a, a, a child that's disabled, you would have to take them off. So there would have been, so this was kind of just a high level review, but if that was, we'd have to do a deeper review too on those to see what members are also being supported by the household. We have heard other agencies are receiving shortfall funding, so we haven't heard anybody not get it that has asked for it yet from the ones that we've talked to. Yes. So. And I did feel much better. Our finance guy said there's, there was one that had a $10 million shortfall. Oh, wow. But it's a really big agency. Oh, so, yeah. you know, it's it's an agency that has a lot of actors. Um, yeah. The email traffic was really positive. I mean, based on what she communicated, so when she missed the meeting, it was like, hey, just give me your stuff. I'm going to start processing it for December, mm -hmm. and then we need to have a meeting. So it looks like I think yeah. we're in a positive spot right here okay. based on what we're doing. Um, the other piece in this is, you know, so we were excluding our project based vouchers. We actually dumped them back in to the shortfall. Yeah, they did ask, uh, based on your PVDs, where do you want them placed? Like, which ones are ready? And I said, well, construction is done. If we can, we want to add all 18 in November um, for Village on Main. So, They'll plug that into the tool. It'll show us what our shortfall is. Between the three years, for the end of this year, um, 2025, and into 2026, we, we had a shortfall. It was about a million 30. And that's what I gave them as my analysis. Um, so. so so here's what happens with the shortfall. So when they fund the shortfall, they then give you that money next year. Oh, okay. So it adds to the money that you get. And then you get that in perpetuity. And so what was interesting in the conversation that we had with our rep, there, there are some agencies that, in my mind, play a really dangerous game, and that they always manage to shortfall. Because that's actually how they're creating additional funds coming in. The danger in that is if Congress doesn't appropriate the funds, you're in a pickle at that point, which we haven't seen it recently, but I remember about 10 years ago, there was a big, no, it was before I got there. It's all over the news how they weren't going to fund it for the vouchers. So we obviously don't do that. There are places that do it. You know, and then when you get into the reserve ratio, that was another eye-opening moment for you because you need to be at 0.4 or 4. 4%. You need to be at 4%. If you're over 4% on your reserves, then you don't get it. They reduce your shortfall funding. And so we're going to have to work at what is the right target that you need to be at on your reserve level because you don't necessarily want to be at 4 because if something happens and you go over four, then it creates an issue. And so we're going to have to start doing some analysis to know what we want to be. Do we need to be at three? Do we need to be at three and a quarter? Because you get penalized if your reserves are over four percent. And it's crazy math to me. But and it, it can change from month to month yeah. because the two-year tool in one month can change your outlook. Um, but their two-year tool will light up in red <laughs> if you've got problems. So, I mean, they, the way that whoever structured that, and it's actually quite comical when you start the two-year tool, they have little funny jokes as you go along, like, HUD was, whoever made the, built, the, built this two-year tool was made little funny jokes as you, as you start to establish your, you know, you're almost there. <laughs> well, Okay. Here's the thing, though. When she says it changes month by month, it changes month by month. And so part of the challenge on the shortfall is, you know, we talked to you all last time about the 2024 numbers going up dramatically, and then they reset into 25, which is what she just talked about. It also depends on when the people recertify. And so part of our problem was we had a lot of people recertifying at the beginning of the year beginning of the year, wasn't it? Or? Um, it actually, so it's pretty steady. 
what was happening is my data was originally taking the actual current research date, which could have been an interim, it wasn't necessarily their annual. Okay. So then when I looked at the annual, we were okay. pretty steady month to month. But with Village on Main, if we had all 18 vouchers in one month, you had all 18 of those changing, you know, being recertified in one month, which could completely change, you know, your monthly data. Do you ever feel secure in your funding? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> No. Yeah. yeah, so like if you like the 18, we want the 18 to go in now because it's later in the year. Because if you wait, the 18 goes into January and you get into this mode, then well, six on one half does another, right? If it goes in in January, you know you're in the hole if something goes up dramatically and then goes down. If it's at the end of the year, you may think you're fine. <laughs> And then yeah. you get to October, November, and you're like, oh crap, we're not fun. Mm -hmm. And so, eh, you know, which way is the best way? It's just, it's a bit of a, this two year tool is, it changes month to month. Mm -hmm. um, so, new positions and changes. Um, the positions being added um, is a new senior account position. Um, we are, with the, with the property increases, our bandwidth is just getting really tight and we also want, um, in the accounting division, to be able to not just do the monthly reports that you have to do to the investors, but also do data and management reports mm -hmm. for the agency as well. So you have the finance side of it and then you have the management side of it. Um, with Zinnia coming on board, with Ascent um, being uh, starting construction, um, it just, it, oh, I need more people. <laughs> um, and the mini hats that, that, that we wear. So um, that's going to be added. We're adding a new maintenance tech position um, to support village on Main Briarwood. And the reason we're doing that is we want to be able to have the maintenance supervisor be a supervisor um, and be able to manage the vacants and the, and the, and the unit terms and then be, be that support person for them to chip in wherever he needs to. And maybe it's the big projects. Um, we are asking that approval to move forward early to use fund balance in 2024 to hire to start hiring these positions in 2024 instead of waiting until 2025 um, the senior accountant position based on I mean by the time we figure out how we can create the separation of duties and how we have to divide um, our individual tasks we're thinking November December time frame um, and that would be about 28,574 for 2024 and then the maintenance tech one position would be about $24,172. And that's salaries, benefits, and realize these benefits we have to, unfortunately for LHA, we have to benefit as if they're going to come in and have a family rate. Um, so they could come in and have a single rate, which is like $15,000 difference um, benefit wise for us. So we budget at the high side. Um, and so it could be less, and then just a computer equipment. So total fund balance is 52,746 is what we're asking to move forward with. And then the budget increases and decreases, kind of what we explained in the first slide, which is the 12% benefits um, and then 100% of fair market. Because we normally were at 101%, but we just didn't feel the budgets could. Is that, that's not a full-time position. Oh, it's only for two months. This is only for two months. Oh, yeah, oh, this is just, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this oh is gosh. just to support them coming in early in 2024 because they're not currently in it. So they're included in the 25 budget. I talked to you all the last time about funding it now. Mm -hmm. um, we did this before on another position. Um, these two specifically were at critical mass. Uh, meaning, in, you know, part, one of the things that I was thinking through is that if, if we didn't have the ability to do this, um, I was seriously considering um, unfunding an assistant manager um, at a property because th 
this is now starting to show itself with being a big issue. So I was preparing myself to make some pretty tough decisions on this budget just because of where we're sitting with these two. You obviously see where we're finding new returns and things like that. The one-time dollars we're bringing in is the baseline on unit turns, and then by adding, you know, having a supervisor in that position, then it increases some capacity for unit turns. Um, part of the contracts, we're also looking at custodial contracts, as well as unit turn contracts that will be on call. Um, and so part of the work Kendra's talking about is doing a financial evaluation to determine what's the ROI on having a maintenance staff person come in and clean and turn the unit versus bringing in a contractual custodian group to clean it and maybe a contractor to come in and turn it based on the amount of time that it's going to take versus the revenue that you're potentially losing. And so it's going to give us the opportunity to make some real time decisions. So what we're hoping to do in this is minimize cost and maximize revenue. So when you say a city position and LHA position, does that mean, for example, the senior accountant that the city that comes out of the city budget? No, what it is is it's um, it's a city position, but it's in the IGA. Okay. So so what that means is LHA still pays for it. We get billed. Okay. So it got this. The city, we're on the city side, but we build LHA for those positions. You'll see, it, you'll see a, a, an expense on the city's budget for the position, but you'll see a revenue line item matching it. Okay. And then on the LHA, it's all internal to the LHA because we moved all of our finance component into the city side. Mm -hmm. so we did talk to the city's budget group and accounting group to make sure just this um, will be committing the revenue to the city by adopting the budget. And also with the data that we'll do for 2025. Okay. okay. And then we get into the property budgets. I know you guys got the long detailed list and you got the short. This is kind of more of the summary list. Um, this will kind of give you an idea. Down here is what revenue, if we have, if, we, if none of our HCD vouchers poured out, this is the amount that we really haven't budgeted for down here, is the $18,000 <coughs> budgeted for some. Um, but that's what this will show down here to show kind of what the ending balance would be. Um, and then we did what we could at what properties we could. We did start um, a math and capital reserve <coughs> accounts last year or a couple years ago. And I put what I can, depending on the budget. And that's that's all outside of if, if we have expenses if we have a boiler replacement for example at the suites <laughs> or if we have something like that and we can't put money in these reserves then we can't put money in the reserves um, but it is budgeted as doing so if if we have the money that's um, smart yeah. um, and so i don't know if you guys have any questions Can you go back? So a couple of things on Aspen Meadow Campus, you see the, the developer fee repayment. Uh, that's because we're at the time frame. Is this the one we're at the time frame where we have to start paying developer fees on this one? Or is there a different Which topic? one? Aspen Meadow Senior? Yeah. Yeah, so, so Senior, we haven't met, been at a good point to pay the deferred developer fees back. Um, I'm hoping this year we are going to have some cash flow to do that. Um, so what we're trying to do is budget for as much as we can in the budget. By now, we should have probably already paid back $100,000, $125,000, but we haven't been able to do so. And partially because in these properties that are being syndicated, we kind of inherit their rent already established. So if their rent already established is not at the tax credit rent, then that rent just moves into that property. And so with both Village Place, we have an issue, and we're going to inherit that, inherit that. But luckily, we got PPP vouchers in there. AMSA, we don't have any PPP vouchers. So we inherited, if tax credit rent was 850 and we're getting 600 from this person we're losing that 250 and so to get up to that tax credit rent is taking some time which is why 
we haven't been able to pay developer fees back to LHA because um, there's been no cash flow. And yeah, I just wanted to emphasize the developer fee is being paid from the property to LHA since we were the we were the developer there. So, so part of it is remember some of you may remember a couple of years ago when we talked about how they were just putting people in the units to get people in and not necessarily at the accurate rents. Mm -hmm. That's the gift that keeps on giving because it's exactly what Kendra was talking about. And the only way you get out of that is either through people moving out or without. Uh, and until someone new comes in, you can't really get into it. And, and then in certain properties, it becomes an ongoing issue because of income qualifications and the rent. And then you'd rather have somebody in at a slightly lower rent than have a vacant unit. Um, we're managing that a little bit better now, but you know I think we're going to keep paying for that for another seven years probably mm -hmm. um, of what happened and how they were putting people into those units. Uh, on Aspen Meadows neighborhood, you see where she's starting to hold fifty thousand. Um, there's a balloon payment on, on that property um, when they uh, when they built it. So. Obviously, we're going to be looking at that for some type of resignification, hopefully, um, in order to deal with that issue. So 2028 is year 15. Yes. Um, and so we had planned to start that resyndication at that time, too, but Chapa also doesn't always fund right at 20, year 15. They want to see more years under the belt. We were able to um, kind of talk our way out of that on Village because it skipped a cycle and just did a critical update. So a lot of it hadn't been touched since 1990. Um, so that's something we'll look at to see if we have some extenuating circumstance where we could try and request it earlier. And we also can probably request to refinance as well if we feel like that's going to be the better better situation. Probably going to be Yeah. Probably. Because I don't think I'm going to make, I'm not, not going to get to the balloon payment by just $50,000 a year. It's not going to happen. It's about $800,000 is what the balloon payment is. It is? Yeah. Yeah. Wow, well, it's crazy to me that you did it that way. Yeah, that's going to be my question. Why did you do a balloon payment? Yeah, so. It's a second property. So if you remember, we had one on, they did the same thing on um, the street. Mm -hmm. On Briarwood, they also did a lot of the on that. Yeah. 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 So we can go. Do you guys have any questions on these ones, or I'll just skip to the LHA general fund? LHA general fund has a couple nuances happening in it. Um, last year, what we kind of funded was um, we funded this because we had the issue with the suite security at the end. Um, we decided that building attendance wasn't the best platform and moved to actual security contract, which is way more expensive. Um, and so LHA did fund out of their general fund that security contract in. For 2025, we have moved that entire contract to the suites. We were able to do that. Um, another um, thing that's happening in 2024 is LHDC paid a corporate management fee to LHA um, for development purposes. But since LHDC is kind of moving out of that platform and going more towards a um, donations, and uh, we provide services like the VIA mobility contract and stuff like that, what LHDC will be funding is amounts that we can't pay or we don't think we can get funding for, for the Hearthstone and Rock. <coughs> so we have some salaries and benefits that aren't fully funded at the Hearthstone and Lodge, and so LHDC will be funding that gap um, for those properties. The other thing is, um, so in 2025, we just have reoccurring revenue, which is our management fees and our snow removal. 
And between 2025 and 2024, you can see we had 639,000 in 2024, but we had the 150 coming in. Um, so we've lost that. We've gained another property in 2025, that's Zinnia, which is 8%, which is actually going to be higher now since they are actually getting 1823 instead of 1675. So that will increase. Um, and then the resource specialist, LH, LHA, also funded um, out of there. It was partially funded by the Hearthstone and Lodge, but the remaining property is LHA funded. And so that is also now moved on to the properties. So the LHA resource specialist is getting paid for by the properties and not LHA. So that's another thing that we moved on the budget, which enables us to add the senior account. It enables us to move Patrick to a more supervisor role. Um, and then I'll let, I'll let I know Harold wants to talk. Yeah. <laughs> so, so on this one, I want to draw your attention to the reoccurring revenue line item. So when you look at 639 versus 606, so out of the 639, take 150,000 out of that. Um, so you're 539, you're at 480,000 because of the 606 that we have in 25, we pulled the 150 from LHDC out. So the key point in this is that the revenue from a recurring perspective is increasing, um, and that's related to the properties that we're bringing online and the work that we're doing. So while it doesn't look great, it's actually we're resetting the budget um, as we're going through. Um, and, and so when you look at this total, scratch everything you know about how we budget on the city side because it is distinctly different on the housing authority side because most housing authorities use the developer fee revenue and their fund balances to offset their ongoing expenses. Um, remember, we're, we're trying to reset that too. So what we've done, when you see the bottom line and the fund balance needed at 905 and 24 versus 903, Put into perspective that we've added a maintenance technician, we've added an accountant, and we've added an assistant director. So when you when you look at those expenses, that's a pretty significant shift financially to where we were. Had we not added those positions, which we needed, you know, the amount we need for fund balance would probably be somewhere in the neighborhood of six hundred and fifty thousand. Um, but we have to have those positions in order to do it. Um, and then the next slide is on the down slide. Um, no, the next slide is LHC. Oh, the best deal. Um, yeah, this, yeah, this is just kind of the next one. So here's the fund balance side. And so when you see how we're utilizing fund balance, you know, what, what I want you to, to look at is, you know, the bottoms piece in, in red. So you see a scent management fee coming in and you see the adjusted ending fund balance. And so if you remember, what, three or four years ago, what was the ending fund balance? About a million and a half? Yeah, so, I mean, yeah. Yeah, so the adjusted ending fund balance for 2025 is now $3 million. So we've increased the fund, the fund balance on, on an annual basis. And so what I'm looking at then, is so we did a couple of things so for the first time ever we created um, a 22 percent operating reserve which is essentially a three-month operating reserve meaning if all revenue stopped we would dig into this which it's highly unlikely that that'll ever happen but that becomes more of a restricted fund balance that we're using so then this becomes the liquid fund balance that we have available to us in terms of what we could use it on for significant expenses. I want you to look around 2028. Um, we need another project to come online in 2028 um, as we're looking at that fund balance. My goal for us is to, um, and this is probably almost an unattainable goal, but uh, I mapped something out with um, Kendra 
to where what I want to do is actually reduce the amount we're drawing down the fund balance annually by at least two hundred thousand dollars. So that would mean next year we're at seven hundred, the year after that we're at five, the year after that we're at three, the year after that we're at two. Uh, but we're balancing with ongoing revenue. Now, I say all of that because I do think it's achievable, um, but when we look at our next project, and I talk to you all about this, um, we're going to have to look at a project that may be a little bit different um, for housing authorities. And, and what I found out from Lauren is this is actually what older housing partners, this is what they do in their projects. Not that we would do it exactly like they do. They build affordable housing, but then they actually build market rate housing as part of the project. And so when you do that, your market rate housing starts spitting off cash. And so when everybody goes, how voter housing partners so solvent, that's what they're doing. And I don't know if the county commissioners have made a decision, but um, I do think that if we get a direct allocation, we do probably need to look at a project that has affordable and attainable rental housing that's income qualified. The attainable housing actually starts spinning, spinning off cash at a higher rate than traditional affordable housing projects. We will never eliminate that gap if all we're doing is building affordable housing. We've got to find a way to bring attainable housing into that mix. If we're able to do that, I think what I just described is definitely we can achieve it by 2031. So, um, but mm -hmm. there's a lot of things that now have to start coming into play. So the conversation you had with council about the uh, parcel of land that you had and then you wanted to know what we wanted to build on it and we gave you basically the Dolores project model. Would that work with attainable? Sweet. Maybe not and that's also got a first round of refusal on it. What I'm thinking about is I talked to you all about a partnership potential mm -hmm. um, near here mm -hmm. but it doesn't need to be there. That's the thing that we learned in the modeling of this. It can almost be anywhere. But if you can go into that, well, we need the direct allocation of the funds. And this is what I've been saying to the county and the county commissioners, is that if we have the direct allocation of funds, you can do either a revenue bond or a certificate of participation for the building itself becomes the primary activity 100%. What you need, the direct allocation from the one you fund to do, is actually meet your debt ratio, probably at 1.25 or 1.3. That then lets you issue the debt at a more traditional government rate, which is, you know, four months ago, if the government rates were, I mean, if a, if a traditional revenue bond was like at six, six and a half percent the government rate we've been able to get, and they priced, they priced this out for us, was about four to four and a half. So if you look at 50 basis point reduction that just occurred, now we could potentially be looking at a 4% interest rate. Um, and we don't absorb all the risk. It's a split of risk with the developer versus absorbing the full risk in how you structure it. Um, and so that changes the economics a lot in terms of what the revenue um, but it's going to take a project like that um, to, to make this happen. But the good news is, you know, I want to take you to the administrative expenditures that you see um, just below where it's high 1.2 million. Kendra's escalating this. I want to decrease it. So every time we can decrease it, you're increasing fund balance. So from a fund balance perspective, we're in a pretty good spot, but we have to get that 28 mark for the new project. Which means starting at 25. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we need 
going to hire more staff. <laughs> well, and in, I would say in that scenario, like the expenses may not decrease, but it's the revenue that we want to increase to reduce the fund balance. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's where we're pushing. Yeah. Hmm. There's mine. <laughs> Somebody have any questions? Well, you turned off the screen. I no. know. <laughs> well, I know. Yeah. 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 Well, I know you, you have a best snow removal. Do we have staff that can will be able to do that this year? I mean, maybe it's not. Mm -hmm. Before the first set applies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's well, and also I would say in in the in how I did the snow removal budget last year, it was a little different because we were adding trucks. Mm -hmm. um, this year, we weren't adding trucks because we had only saved in the prior years for that. That in this budget I did add. I just don't know how it would work, but if if they did need a tank to come on board, that's that's kind of how I budgeted the snow removal if 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 a tank was needed. Yeah, so that's actually a good point. So we talked to you all. We didn't have any equipment. Right. So now they have both trucks. Just one. Not just one. The other one. Mm -hmm. have it. Alrighty. He had to look at a different one. He wasn't going to be able to give us the one that he thought he could give us. Okay. So, I've heard. Uh, Not as worth the money. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so, what's behind it? They can use. We're going to get to some. Yeah, so what's yeah. behind it is we're, we're buying the trucks with the depreciated value from the city. Mm -hmm. And then we're depreciating it over time so that when it comes time to replace it, then we can buy a new truck for them. So they're actually getting equipment now versus not having equipment versus getting equipment. Maybe we can double check on that sidewalk. Okay. Uh, 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 going to or whatever it is. Any more questions? No. We have a motion. So that's the resolution for the payment standards. I think we would want a motion for the budget of the world draw. Oh, okay. And that's the budget presentation. Budget presentation. Okay. I move the 2025 budget. Okay. Can I move the 2025 budget? 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 Can I move the Martin, sorry. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? That passes 6 to 0 with the commission was absent. So now we're going to go on to the uh, LHA 2024 uh, 22 resolution. And this is to, for the 2025 payment standards for Housing Choice Voucher Program. We went through that already. Right? Yeah, mm -hmm. so that was described in the slides. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. accepting the 2025 fair market rates at 100% with the admin plan mm -hmm. notes so, attached. Yeah. So can we have a motion for 2024-22? So all move resolution LHJ 2024-22. Second. It's been moved by Commissioner Hidalgo Ferry, seconded by Commissioner uh, McCoy to move resolution LAJ 2024-22. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? That passes 6-0 with Commissioner Chris Absent. Any more questions? Any other 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 questions?
Um, we, so we do have a lot of money currently right now sitting in um, both our operating and I just moved some to a money market until we could get this approved. Okay. Um, but what we would like to do is move it to CSAFE, which is a more liquid asset that has um, basically it combines your money with a bunch of other government entities and it's also very liquid. We didn't want to move to a CD because a CD um, you can be penalized if you, if you need the funds soon. So CSAFE seemed to be the best option and what Jim Golden um, recommended. Um, but we have to do a resolution. We got all our accounts set up. I was ready to transfer money. And then uh, they asked for a resolution <laughs> and realized I didn't have that signed yet. So that's what this is. Um, and, and technically, this could, right now, it was, I think, at 5% interest. And so if we put a good chunk of money in there, we could get the 200000 that he's talking about. <laughs> okay, okay. Secrets. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if we do. <laughs> so now that, yeah, it's 5%, we we'll get close. So this is a, an online virtual uh, it's money that um, either Harold or Molly can transact um, to to see safe, and then you can automatically transfer it back if you need to without penalty. So if you fund it sooner than cities use this, so it meets the standards that we have to in terms of investments. It's not market investments for you. This is a pretty conservative investment. For you. Okay, can I have a motion here for LHA 2024? All those LHA 2024 dash 23. Second. We move by Commissioner Calvin Perry, seconded by Commissioner Yoko. Uh, to move LHA 2024 dash 23. Uh, is there any discussion on this since we did have much of a presentation? Oh, that sounded bad. <laughs> I did. We're happy to play. <laughs> <laughs> so I I like a presentation. I All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? That passes uh, six to zero with uh, Commissioner Chris Apps. 89. We are now on development updates. This is. Uh, I'll take this one. Okay. We have had quite the few weeks. Um, <laughs> you might see it on our faces a little bit. It was a big success. We're ready for naps. Um, okay. Yes. September 27th, we closed ascent, and construction started the following Monday. Um, we closed it at about 6 p.m. Friday. We had our uh, bankers were all East Coasters, so they were working on this, doing final authorizations about 8 p.m. on Friday night. Um, we needed to do that before Monday the 30th so that we avoided our rate lock expiring mm -hmm. and changed all the financials, um, we, which was huge. So we are under construction. We are talking about a ribbon cutting for, or I should say groundbreaking, um, coming in November. So that will all be coordinated with um, the council schedule. And you'll all be invited, of course. Um, and then on same day, we received our certificate of substantial completion on our building permit for Village on Main, mm -hmm. which we needed also by that Monday, or else we faced a downward adjuster from our tax credit investor. Um, we could have you know, worked with our investors as much as possible, but we knew we could make it, so, mm -hmm. so we agreed to it, and we did. Um, we are just doing our final punch items and final furniture deliveries and final cleanup now. So we'll also be doing, it might be a bit busy, maybe a week or two in November, where we're gonna do a grand opening for Village. Mm -hmm. um, it looks beautiful. The residents are generally so happy um, there's always going to, we say this every time, there's always adjustments to change. But overall, the message we've heard is we were so worried about this, but look, it looks amazing and they're happy. So um, that is a big, big one as well. The following Tuesday, October 1st, 
Zinnia opened, and our first 30 out of 55? 52 units out of 55 are already released within two weeks. Within two weeks. So they moved in like 30 the first day, and then some rounds up until just to present. So that was a big deal as well. It was a big lift, and it was a true, you know, we've talked about LHA trying to get our development ramped up for the past four years. And there's a point where, okay, we can, we can get the developments done, which we have been, but then it transitions to operations. And you better be able to walk the walk and talk the talk if you're going to say that we're able to do all this development and be the phoenix rising in the housing authority community. And so having Zinnia leased up so successfully um, really was a testament to that. And we have so many, I mean, there's so many things that we have um, taken from that experience that we're going to carry through as mm -hmm. all of the other new developments as they come online um, transition to operations too. So super proud of the team. It was a hard one because we have not done a lease up since Fall River, which mm -hmm. none of the current staff were around for. So it was a big feat. So good job operations. Um, and then this is not specifically on the housing authority, but just it's in the same vein and generally the same team members. Um, we closed on the land transition over to vertical for the city's um, home ownership project, 185 units. We did that on Friday. Was it Friday? Thursday. Thursday. It was Thursday, uh, one Thursday. minute before the uh, title company said we can't do it. Yep. Mm, Signed wow. everything a minute before. So that was from September 27th to October 10th, mm -hmm. which is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big portfolio yeah. to take on for a large housing authority. Um, so I'm just super proud of the team that really booked it to get this done because these are the culminating projects we've been working on for four years. Yes. Mm -hmm. So. So, yeah. So you know. So here's the the, the backstory to this. A, they, they all do phenomenal work. They uh, went to Housing Colorado last week. Wednesday. So. So we closed. This, we they closed were closing on the people were there. there and. We were on the phone Friday. Um, everybody was going up to them going, how's Longmont doing this? How's Longmont Housing Authority doing this? Um, and it's just a testament to all the folks in this room and those that aren't in this room. You know, and you look at Katie and Kayleen. And, um, yeah, Katie. There's, there's a lot of people. Um, and Christy and everyone else, I think, um, you know, you talk about large, you, you talk about large housing authorities and you talk about what people are able to do. It's not about size. None of this is about size. This is about the people that you have and the people that are doing the work. And, um, you know, I would say we can look at the county and we can look at builder housing partners and neither one of them are, are producing the amount of units and, and the work this group is doing with probably a quarter of the staff and, and so we're lucky to have this entire team and Tim because Tim's in the middle of all of these helping to solve problems and, but um, it's a good thing and uh, I just want you to know um, how lucky we are to have these folks here and the commitment and the dedication and the fact that we knew well, we need another one in 28 and they're like well that means we need to start it now balancing workload but nobody flinches and um wow. great staff very impressed and uh, yeah i have other mayors asking me as well is that so mm -hmm. everything and erica keeps us all sane <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> and also, an accounting played a huge role well too. We didn't specify that, but they're through every little last drop. Um, so we're going to be closing up some, putting some bows on this, some things okay. through the end of the year, and then 2025, we're looking towards the 2028 project, um, trying to sort out some creative funding opportunities and then um, starting to dive into the Hearthstone and Lodge to exit that 202 program because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. in 2020. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Making one what? Chrisman one and two. Oh. 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 Which means two new pro two more properties that we'll be managing. Mm -hmm. Oh, another hundred and eighty units. Yeah. Or so. So, and, and that's an interesting one for those of you. Um, I don't know who all was here when we did this. For Christmas two, we re we when we negotiated Christmas two, we restructured Christmas one, mm -hmm. and so for what about two and a half million, we're probably getting sixty million worth of value of properties that the housing authority will own mm -hmm. and manage. So then that creates a different ongoing revenue source. So. Is that incorporated into this? No. So, yeah. no. By 2028, even without the 2028 project to be sorted, we're going to double the portfolio. Just with Chrisman, Ascent, Zinnia. Which I just want to say is crazy. Yes. <laughs> As a developer, it's nuts. And the thing about development, it's like childbirth. You forget how painful it was and then you're ready for another one. <laughs> So, <laughs> then you make the same mistake. Yeah. 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 No, there's so many lessons to be learned, as the word I'll say. Yeah, and you do the same. More. But you do, you learn from those, but then there's always new opportunities for ways to learn other so things. That, so, what's behind that then is standard operating procedures. So, as they're going through things, you're white papering it. Mm -hmm. And so that you have a playbook that as you're going into the next one, it's like, okay, we made these mistakes, let's not make these. Mm -hmm. And you're going to make some more. And then you're going to, and so eventually you'll get to the point where it becomes pretty seamless. But uh, yeah, Kendra, we didn't include the revenue for Christmas 1 and 2 and 27, 28, or 28. Yeah, no, they're not in our portfolio at all. They're not in yeah, so that's going to be another revenue increase that we've been projecting 28. And that one, like, goes to So I have a question that relates to the properties as well as to the budget. Um, I toured Xenia with Michael Block uh, a couple of days ago, and it's impressive. It is, it's a beautiful building. Um, but we started, I started asking him about the cuts that the county was making, mm -hmm. and I wonder how this is going to affect your budget, specifically for, Michael said that his budget was being cut 300000 uh, how is that going to affect wraparound services at the Xenia? Um, what was the other one? Oh, mental health partners is being cut pretty, pretty um, easy. Michael, we have a conversation ongoing as well. Do you? Because he wants to look at the projections for the tenant services funding. Partly because Zinnia assumed that Medicaid would come in and do reimbursement for some of those on their end, on all roads' side. And he doesn't have confidence that that's going to come through in the timeline that was anticipated. Um, so we have not sorted any numbers or anything or even proposed any solutions quite yet, but we do know that um, what is being looked at with the Prop 1B funding is housing-related supportive services set-asides. And so I'm sure that all roads will be looking to that either through Longmont, if it comes through Longmont, or through Boulder County. Also, what, what we've got to be careful on on this is that if the county cut the funding to all roads, there's a contract though between Zinnia and all roads. Oh, so and they don't so, have to. so what right. we have to make sure of is that all roads doesn't pass their funding cut down mm -hmm. in through the Zinnia project where there's mm -hmm. they can't balance their cut organizationally against mm -hmm. something that they're contractually obligated to do. So we're going to pay really close attention to mm -hmm. yeah. the numbers and how they're approaching it. So does that funding then go to Elements since they own? Elements funding all roads, right? Through Correct. The DOH funds, the supportive services are a combination there is some DOH, this is going back to reviewing a growth form from like two years ago. Um, but there's some combination from DOH and then element funding it through proceeds and that type of thing. We knew that at year six of Zinnia, they were going to be coming and seeking out additional tenant services support funding. So the haven't had the full conversation yet to see with what year is the concern. But we'll sort it out. Okay, just curious. There's another 
grand opening that will be scheduled for potentially November. <laughs> so it's going to be busy. Okay. Uh, uh, so we're, we're talking about talked about that with Walker. So his, he's got a public relations team working on that. Mm -hmm. um, Sandy, we're going to be getting with the comms team on on house pads. So yeah, you'll have. Village on Main, Village, Ascent, Ascent, Zinnia, and House Pad. Some sort of ribbon cutting or ground bike breaking within the next the best three thing. weeks. Giant person for for Zinnia as well? Mm -hmm. Okay. I was going to ask if we, were, if we could do a tour. Oh, yeah. But we'll, uh, that will be yeah. during that. Okay. We know that they'll have units open that we can be. Oh, perfect. Okay. Great. You'll be sitting there. Yeah, so that's it on development of things. That was great. Mm -hmm. So well, mm -hmm. occupancy, occupancy report. So what you'll see if you look at the occupancy report, this was pulled this together at the beginning of the month. We have a lot of vacants. This is a culmination of a history of lengthy unit turn timelines, meth units that have been ongoing. But we are down two maintenance. One was terminated, and one was is on rental leave. Mm -hmm. um, neither of these were something we were prepared for, you know, looking for. Um, mm -hmm. So we have a skeleton crew of three maintenance staff covering ten properties right now, okay. including a brand new one that just opened new construction, which always has some kinks to work out, and Village on Main also new, technically new construction with the recent vacation. Um, so I will say they're doing fabulous for the fact that there's only three of them. Um, and that's just barely been a team effort between property management and the maintenance, relying on each other, being in constant communication, um, and just collaborating all day every day. Um, I, so I am personally really grateful that you have approved the additional maintenance person in 2025 and then allowed us to hire that now because we need the support now so that our staff doesn't burn out. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have a solution for our own Yes. Well, the meeting later this week. Yeah. Um, so as we get ready for the snow season, um, we're just <coughs> planning on a lot of work. I also want to thank you for the additional funds for the unit terms because that's really going to help um, alleviate a lot of the, the work as well and kind of set that baseline and the new expectation. Because it's been really hard to tease out why it has taken so long to do unit terms. Um, it, it's not something that we have really been able to quantify in any you know, meaningful way. So um, this will sort of set a baseline for us to go going forward and set expectations. Um, and we'll have two new people on the team, which is always invigorating to have new, new um, people join. Um, so I won't go through all the make ready or all the vacants that are there. Um, but I, I did just want to point out, just in, in support of your decision, the something I've added to this is the affordable unit vacancy loss. Mm -hmm. So if you look at that little tiny um, chart at the bottom, right, mm -hmm. you know, this is what we're losing in revenue by having these vacants sit for so long and not be rented. And it's $430,000. Yeah. It's not nothing. Um, so if we can address this going forward, uh, we're also going to be increasing our revenue by doing that. And there are, you know, real consequences to not having units filled at the end of the year. Just another, another thing that we're scrambling to fix um, before December thirty first with the additional maintenance and the contracted unit terms. And LHA also does lose out on management fees because it's based on the money that's brought in. So. The four hundred and thirty six thousand dollars we've lost management fees against that right as well. So really hammering home with the team. You know, there's been a lot of change this year. Um, getting everybody on board for what's coming in twenty twenty five because we're just we're gonna end up with more properties going forward and so we need a strong um, core team to lead us into the, all those changes. Well and this is a byproduct of you of a wedding helping us find the assistant director position because these are things we never had time to get to. So now you're seeing the, the detail starting to come through. It's 
painful at first, but it's beneficial in the end. Um, and then for property updates, um, I didn't have anything prepared in writing for the packet, but I'll just run through that really quick. Um, we did a three-day yardy training with all of our staff a couple weeks ago, um, which Kendra pulled together with our yardy rep, which uh, covered property management, maintenance, finance, and the HCB staff. Um, it was pretty intense, but it was very beneficial. There's just so much when, when LHA turned to Yardi, there was a lot of functionality that wasn't being utilized. Um, sometimes that just happens because you start using it and you're just limping along with what you can do and you don't really have the time to look into what's available. Um, so I'm super grateful to Kendra and her team for putting that together because now there's more that we can, we can do. Um, especially with changes coming up with Rent Cafe and mobile maintenance. Uh, we have a new assistant community manager starting 1021, the one that might have potentially gotten cut if we didn't fund other things. Um, so she's starting on Monday next week, and she'll be floating from property to property, and I think that that would really help kind of lighten the property management load for a few of our properties that don't have a dedicated person. Um, Second round interviews for our regional property manager are happening next week. We did our first round interviews last week. We have three really qualified and strong candidates. Um, so I'm really excited to hand those duties off once they're hired. Um, maintenance team update, like I mentioned, we have a vacancy due to a termination. One on caregiver leave, the new position we approved tonight. Um, excited to have a fully built team going into 2025 and, and kind of rebuild that group. Housing Colorado was last week. We had a bunch of staff there on the HCI side and LHA. Um, it was really invigorating. It's a nice time to, to kind of reset and remember why you do this work because it is really hard. Um, whether you're doing development or operations is intensive. Um, Zinnia, we have 52 tenants out of 55 moved in as of um, October 10th. This was a huge lift for um, my staff, the property manager, Jana who um, single-handedly approved all the paperwork up until the week before everyone started to move in, um, while also managing the suites. And this is our largest um, campus in our portfolio now, these two properties that we're managing. Um, between our staff um, filling in for the lease-ups, doing you know, group lease-ups, we about three to four property managers there every day that we were doing lease-ups to help out. Um, the All Road staff and MHP doing their voucher um, uh, meetings before Lisa was just, it was amazing the way we worked together because it was a super, I've never done a Lisa, I'm not a property manager by trade, so mm -hmm. I felt like I had no clue what I was doing, but clearly we did okay. Mm -hmm. uh, we beat the, the record for Bluebird, which Element also owns in Boulder, and we leased up faster than that. So, um, you know, I think we benefited from their experience there, but. We also have just a really killer team. Um, we have our budget sessions for coffee and conversations coming up to talk about rental increases. That's a good one today, Fall River. Um, they're looking forward to those conversations and, and finding out more information. Operational challenges with staffing, but overall, I think the morale is good with our staff. Um, change is hard, and this team is resilient. They've been through a lot um, since 2020, for those who were here. Um, and have been on board since then, but you know what they really have and what you need in this industry is grit and determination. I'm not going to give up just because it's hard, because it's always hard. Um, but we celebrate our wins when we can, and they get back to work. And we had several inspections uh, within the last six months at a couple properties with little to no deficiencies or issues, mm -hmm. which is also great. Um, and then uh, also just want to give a huge shout out to our Suites Clinician team. Um, we have two clinicians funded through the city. Um, that are already there. They've been established there for a few months now, and um, we are actively recruiting for the third clinician that is LHA funded. Um, we have seen a very marked difference in the residents after having Rick and Brianna on site. Mm -hmm. It has made a world of difference for the residents. They have someone to talk to, someone to help them through issues, the collaboration between MHP the clinicians and our on-site staff has been amazing. Um, we're seeing reduced calls for service um, and just have, they have way more support. And so if you were ever questioning if that was the right decision, it absolutely was. Mm -hmm. And I hope we can um, expand and do more as we grow. Yeah. 
Yeah, you're still <coughs> operationalizing how we take your goals of mental health, <coughs> housing, and these issues, and, and we're starting to fold everything in. So it's, it's a comprehensive approach versus a fragmented approach. It makes a big difference. And we're actively working on this whole Salesforce thing, which I don't fully understand. But we're bringing all of that together um, as well to, to really make it operate faster, easier, better for, for people. Yes, yeah, so our case management is all going into Salesforce, <coughs> uh, operationalizing, enabling care in communities where it, if there's a disturbance in the force, so if there's a tenant that has an issue or something that goes on, the system will automatically connect everybody that's working with that individual. And so instead of, and Sarah can, when she talks about her safety approach, when it happens now, it's like a scramble in cell phones. We're all talking to each other, calling back and forth. This will immediately bring the group together and has chat functions. And, and so you get the right people dealing with the issue at the right time versus, in some cases, the wrong people at the right time, which then makes it worse. Okay. And then Sarah's got her. Safety, um, yes, public health and safety. So um, calls for service first. Uh, the suites are ahead of everyone else. Um, 17 in the last month. Um, most, of, Some of them were core follow-ups and just to kind of uh, add to what Lauren and Harold were saying about the clinicians at, at the suites. Our core unit is working hand-in-hand -hand with these folks too. So, um, and I'm working pretty closely with the clinicians as well as far as calls for service, keeping up on the folks that, you know, what are we doing with you know, the person that might be having um, going spiraling right now, and like, what, let's wrap our ourselves up into that person, to make sure that we're providing what we can. Um, so, so for perspective, if you remember when we took over, we were getting seven calls a week. Oh yeah. yeah. Yes. Sometimes this, a day. Sometimes a day. Yeah. It's really, I mean, just diving into the data. We're seeing just a few, you know, we're not getting the disturbances and the violent um, things that we were seeing before. Mm -hmm. So, not saying that, I mean, I'm not, not going to change this, yeah. but, um, you know, we're, we've been in a good place. So, um, AMN had two, there were welfare checks. AMSA had one welfare check. The Lodge had one call. Hearthstone had one call. Village on Main had three parking problems, most likely due to construction and, and residents trying to figure things out. Um, Briarwood had zero. Fall River had 15. That was kind of a, a large number for them, and that was due to um, a resident issue that we were having. Residents were calling. Um, that problem, as you'll see next month, has pretty much gone away, which is good. Um, that person's in a better place and still living in property. Um, for now. Um, then Spring Creek just had one, so not too bad for the month. That's great. Um, update you on our meth detectors. So right now we only have one. I took one down today because there's no need for where we had it. Um, so now, now we only have one that I'm monitoring. Um, I think the, ne the next uh, one we put in, we're waiting for a unit to, it's been clean and decon, and now we just need to go in. It needs to be released to us, number one, but go in, rebuild it, and put it in at the suites. So the goal is to make sure we're putting in the clean units. Um, so that's that, and then the walk village on Main today, as Mo Molly indicated, everything's beautiful there. Um, very impressed, the residents seem happy. I met um, one of our camera installers there to go over our cameras that have been in place. That was our first property that you know, the cameras are in. And so, um, we took two years. Dan Hill, our IT or CIT person, is out on vacation this week, but he'll be back. Um, I'm going to configure the cameras and kind of what, what we're doing with the ones on the outside and what we're looking at. Make sure we get staff trained to be able to, you know, utilize that system as well. Um, and that's all I have. Does anyone um, have any questions for me? What Sarah had, didn't mention is she's 
found a company that has a, so we're constantly chasing this net thing, right? And she found a company that has a process where you spray stuff on it, and it's a foam. Um, this company works with the FBI, the Secret Service, all of our military branches, because they do this for other things. And um, basically, it lets you avoid the demolition. And we've now been connected to a company that has been actively utilizing this product. And so Sarah's going to be, we're going to run some tests. Mm -hmm. Once we run the test, that could theoretically change how we are approaching meth detectors because um, you don't necessarily have the risk of having to demo an entire unit. And um, it's, um, it's crazy stuff because it even goes into drywall and porous surfaces and it kills it on contact. Wow. And, and so this one company... <coughs> so it's in the and I actually met with, just kind of adding to what you're saying about the company that uses our product. So we met with Intelligard, saw his product, um, you know, we had an internal discussion about training maintenance to utilize this product and that's just with our turnover and the cost to train someone to do that, it's just too expensive. So we found a company that has been using their product for at least seven years now, and they have not had they've not had one demo. Mm -hmm. So um, we did met them yesterday at um, the Hearthstone, which still has a bathroom that's down, and we're waiting on a bid for them to come out and clean clean what's needed, and then also do AMSA's bathrooms. And so mm -hmm. I'm really excited moving forward. Work. They, they seem like, and they they're actually offering education to their staff um, on that what you need, what you need to be prepared, you know, aware, all of these things. So they've been in the, in the industry for some time, so it's, it seems like a good fit. If you, uh, if you find that really works and it's something that you, a company you want to go with, think about having an educational component for the, for the public. Mm -hmm. Because we have houses that have been down a long time. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. yes. And, uh, and working with, so I'm working very closely with code enforcement right now. Mm -hmm. So um, we work in obviously the public safety side of the, with the meth houses. So um, having these companies, you know, literally meeting them, having the information, and knowing that they do good work is definitely worth spreading. Exactly. Thank you. Okay, is that it? Good. A lot, but it's good. Yeah, it's good. Mm -hmm. And you're still upright. <laughs> I don't know if it's the chairs or <laughs> but so um, can I have a motion to adjourn the LHA chain? So moved. Second. It's been moved by uh, Commissioner Martin, seconded by Commissioner. <laughs> um, can I have um, uh, Oh, <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, All those closed. We are in charge. Okay.